Hello! Yo, yo, what's up, guys? It's your boy BD, everyone's favorite amalgamation of the average of all pro audio YouTubers. I'm back on your screens with some fresh new content. Let's roll that intro. Before we go any further, I'd like to ask that you smash that like button, hit the sub subscribe, and ring the notification bell so that you can stay informed the next time I post a load of old clickbait drivel on the internet. <laughs> I mean, more marvelous, high quality, informative content. In today's video, we'll be taking an exclusive first look at a brand new product from Solid State Logic, the UF1. Is it any good or is it lizard oil? But more importantly, I'll be covering the 10 secret fundamental concepts of audio engineering that the pros, for some reason, don't want you I want you to know about, and I know what you're thinking. Why should you listen to BD? Well, and I don't want to brag, but I was actually assistant to the T-Boy on 1996's top-selling record in the then niche but still upcoming genre of Gorgonian mythological symphonic speed metal. I've taken a little bit of a step back from working in the industry, but since then I've been making weekly videos on topics I'm definitely qualified to talk about. So don't worry, you're safe with me. BD content. And don't forget to check out today's sponsor. If you use the code Chillionaire, buy my tasteless merch. You can get 2% off a 10 year subscription to a Zless VPN brand that you hadn't even heard of until 5 seconds ago. Let's take a look at Plugin Doctor. Content. Unleash your inner content. So let's talk about Gainster. <laughs> Oh my god. Andy is gonna kill me. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Hi, I'm Benny Dunville. You may remember me from previous SSL scandals, but today we'll be taking a look at the brand new UF1 and the updates to 360 that come in version 1.5 from Solid State Logic. Hey, so quick little edit. Going forward, you're going to see a lot of footage of UF1, UC1 and UF8. Now, some of the footage isn't the best quality, I know. There's nothing I can do about that. But I wanted to let you know that any flashing or blinking lights that you see in the clips of the units is purely a camera issue of some sort. In reality, with the units, they do not do this. They have solid lights. Just wanted to clear that up. Wait, hang on, it's still got sick on it. Let's Back in early 2021, SSL unveiled the UF8, an eight-channel door controller, shortly followed up by the UC1, a channel strip and bus compressor plug-in controller. I think it's probably fair to say both of these products had a successful launch and were met with a positive reception. However, there was one thing that seemed to plague the release of the UF8. And no, I'm not talking about COVID. The shrill sound of digital moaning and whining could be heard echoing across YouTube comment sections and internet forums. For all ye behold, the UF8 has no transport controls or a scrub wheel. Now, this wasn't entirely true, of course. The UF8 did have both of these things, just they weren't dedicated controls. But still, a reasonable request for the future, I thought, perhaps to be seen in a single channel master section unit for the UF8 and UC1. And lo and behold, would you believe it, the future is here, and so is the UF1. UF1 gives you a single one of the high quality, high resolution faders found on UF8. Of course, complemented with the rest of the channel strips trimmings, UF1 also gives the user those highly requested transport controls and a jog wheel. 
And of course, this absolutely amazing 4.3 inch IPS display in the center section, which can be used to view door information, soft key functions, or a brand new 360 view that gives you control over your channel strip plugins and a view of your EQ curves, or let 360 do its computer brain magic and link up with the brand new SSL meter plugin and display the plugin GUI right in front of you on UF1. You can use UF1 on its own as an extremely fully featured single channel door controller or use it in conjunction with a UF8, a UC1 or both for an enhanced and tightly integrated SSL experience. UF1 is a very comprehensive unit and on top of that, the latest update to SSL 360 has added a lot of new features and integration between the three different hardware controllers. So this might be a long one, just be prepared. Bear in mind that I am a Logic user and certain features of door controllers can vary from door to door. So just keep in mind that some things may be a little bit different for you. Let's face it though, there's bound to be someone who's gonna start whinging about Reaper in the comment section. I also won't be covering any kind of unboxing or initial setup of the UF1, by which I mean both the physical setup of the device, but also getting started and making the connection between UF1 and your computer. If you'd like to see instructional content on that, I would kindly suggest that you check out the videos my friends at SSL have made. So here we are in a logic session. Currently UF8 and UC1 are disconnected from SSL 360, the software that acts as the brains for all of these SSL controllers. So currently I am only using UF1. As you can see, the track is playing, which is reflected on UF1's big screen with a bright and colorful timecode readout of our session. This can be swapped between Sempty or Beats and Bars. Within 360, there are options to turn off this readout or dim it. In the center of the screen, we can see the word PAN or part of the word PAN with PN. This is telling us that UF1 is currently using PAN mode of the VPOT assignment function of the Mackie control protocol. The light blue color of the text and the way that the mode soft key is lit indicate that we are also currently operating in general door mode. I'll link back to these modes and some of the other functions currently indicated on the screen later. UF1 can host up to three different door layers, meaning you can switch between three different software applications for UF1 to control. You do this by holding down the 360 button and then choosing your layer with the top soft keys. Let's go down to the bottom of UF1, where I can stop, play, fast rewind and fast forward and navigate through our session using the jog wheel. The jog wheel also has a scrub mode toggled with the scrub soft key here. To the left of the jog wheel are the cursor keys, which give us some navigation options. Pressing up or down changes the selected track in Logic. If we press the center key, the surrounding cursor buttons now allow us to control the level of zoom in Logic. I can move through track markers, toggle Logic's cycle range, and turn the click on and off. Pressing the shift key switches this row of soft keys into automation selection keys, where you can enable automation off, read, write, trim, latch, or touch modes for the channel currently displaying on UF1. The soft keys labeled one and two are UF1's quick keys, with the idea being they're customizable by the user. Quick key one currently toggles logic mixer window on and off on my main window. However, it's not just the quick keys that are user customizable. This entire row of soft keys can actually be changed within the 360 app to host new functions. Personally, I really like the default options provided here, but if you wanted to change them to different door commands or even your own custom keyboard macros, you can. Sticking with the topic of user customizable soft keys, at the very top of UF1, we have four more, with their function displayed clearly on the screen below. There are 10 pages of soft key functions that we can scroll through using these arrow keys, all of which are fully user customizable in SSL 360. The screen displays which soft key page we are currently on. This gives us access to 40 custom soft keys at the top of UF1. If we press the 360 soft key, it will automatically open the 360 app in the UF1 configuration menu. Simply choose the page, the soft key you'd like to customize, and then you can decide to assign the key to a built-in door function or create a keyboard macro for a custom function. 
As you can see, I have door commands set up on the first three soft keys with save, undo, and redo. Relatively easy keyboard shortcuts to execute, but it's nice having them in front of me on a single button press. Custom macros allow you to program more complicated strings of commands. Having multiple key commands follow each other, all triggered from a single button press. Obviously, this is a very simple example with only two steps, but you could trigger a macro of Control B to open the bouncer region in place window and follow it up with a return key to automatically hit the OK button and begin rendering your region. Provided the bounce in place window has the correct settings loaded up for your use case, this could be a quicker way to bounce your tracks in place than manually inputting the key commands, especially if you're creating a more complicated macro with more than two steps. And you can indeed make much more complicated macros with huge numbers of steps if desired. SSL 360 1.5 adds the ability to put a delay between steps in the macro. Sometimes a macro can actually trigger the steps more quickly than the computer can respond to them. So a delay can be useful to ensure that all steps are triggered accurately. Moving away from transport and general door functions, on the left side of UF1, we have our channel control area. UF1's small screen displays the title of the channel that we are currently viewing. If the track is also selected in the door, we will see Rec in red and the channel select soft key will be lit. At the top of the screen, the word PAN refers to the PAN VPOT assignment mode. The Mackie controller protocol has several different VPOT assignment modes, which change the function of the VPOTs. If we were in a different VPOT assignment and pressed the PAN soft key, VPOTs would be returned to this default state of controlling the channel's PAN position. As you can see, turning the VPOT now changes the channel's PAN position, which is also reflected on the screen with a numerical value and a graphic of the position. We can also press the VPOT to return to our default PAN position. Moving down, we have a solo key to solo the current track and a cut key to mute it. Below is a select key to make the current track we are viewing on UF1 also the currently selected track in Logic. UF1's motorized fader gives us fine, smooth control over our door's fader and track volume. But with a press of the flip soft key, we can move whatever is currently being controlled on the VPOTs down onto the fader. So now I am controlling the channel's pan via my fader probably not something that you would actually want to do. But with the other VPOT assignment modes, you can have the VPOTs control your send level and plugin and instrument parameters, which you can then move onto the fader with the flip key. It's perfect for writing in automation, but we'll come back to that in a bit. The master key switches the channel fader to instead control Logic's master fader. In case you didn't know, this is Logic's own internal master fader that comes right at the end of the chain. It's literally just a fader and has no plugin or routing capabilities, but you can automate it. So it can be useful for adding fade ins and fade outs at the top and tail of songs. In its default state, the channel encoder is how we navigate to different tracks in our door session on UF1. In channel mode, as displayed here on the screen, we can scroll the channel encoder to move through our tracks one at a time. And to the right of the channel encoder, the bank soft keys allow us to bank through tracks in groups of eight. If you press the channel encoder, we have the option of switching it to different modes. Highlight the mode and press down on the encoder again to select it. Fader select mode lets us change which channel is the focus within each bank of eight. By default, channel one will be the focus. If we were to change that to say channel three, which is indicated by the number in the top left of the channel display. As we scroll through banks, rather than showing us the first channel within the bank, UF1 will show us the third. Focus mode carries over from UF8 and turns the channel encoder into a mouse scroll wheel, handy for interacting with plugins in a tactile way. For instance, I can hover my mouse over a knob in the new GML8200 plugin from Pulsar and can quickly make adjustments to the plugin settings with an actual knob. It will also work on faders, as we can see with Artoria's Lexicon 244 reverb, and of course is a perfect pairing with something like the SSL 4KB if you don't have a UC1. I use a trackpad in my left hand, mainly for gestures, 
but it also means I can quickly move between plugin parameters whilst keeping my right hand on the channel encoder in focus mode. The final form of the channel encoder is volume mode. This turns the channel encoder into a master volume dial for your entire system audio, if the interface that you use allows for that function. Mine does not, so as I turn the encoder, I get this graphic pop up on my screen. I'm sure you've seen this before when accidentally hitting the volume keys on a Mac keyboard with your dirty great sausage fingers. God save the king. UF1 may only have a single fader, but it is not a single channel door controller. We can actually have control over multiple channels at the same time, thanks to the four additional VPOTs at the bottom of the screen. These function exactly the same as the VPOT on your channel section, but give us access to the other seven channels within the currently selected bank. So the first VPOT represents channel one within my bank, which is the same as the VPOT on my channel control but I then have control of the next three channels with the other VPOTs. If I press the soft key labeled five to eight, I can see the next four channels within the bank, channels five through eight. As I scroll through channels in my mix, you can see that I have main control of one channel on the fader of UF1, but I can easily access VPOT controls for the rest of the channels in that bank without having to shift the focus of UF1. Earlier, I mentioned that we'll be using general door mode. This means that those additional VPOTs will follow the currently selected VPOT assignment mode, currently pan mode, thus allowing us to control the pan position of the eight channels within our bank. If we press the mode button, it will light up green. The color of the main screen changes and we see the word fader. We are now in door fader mode. Door fader mode essentially ignores the currently selected VPOT assignment mode for these four VPOTs and instead assigns them to control the fader level of the eight tracks within the bank. So now in door fader mode, I can adjust the fader level of the next seven channels in my mix using the VPOTs, even writing automation across multiple channels at the same time if I wanted. It's not quite the same feeling as grabbing multiple faders and riding levels on a UF8, but it's a fantastic addition to UF1 and not something that I've seen done before on a single channel controller. One thing I seemingly forgot to mention, activating door fader mode leaves UF1's main VPOT in its currently selected VPOT assignment mode. So you could, for example, control the main track fader level for the rest of the tracks in your bank and also still have control over the send level of your main selected track. From here, if we press the mode soft key again, we get this kind of blank error message screen. I'm teasing you though, we'll be coming back to this later. But press the mode key once more and you can see that we've cycled back to the beginning of our different modes. Hold down the mode key and we can jump straight to the mode of our choice using the soft keys at the top of UF1. So far, I've touched a little bit on VPOT assignment modes, but let's take a closer look at the sort of things that they allow you to do. If you'd like more information on how the VPOT assignment modes and the Mackie protocol as a whole works, I would recommend accessing the Logic Pro control surfaces support provided within Logic from the help menu. The default or main VPOT assignment mode is PAN, which can always be accessed by the soft key above the channel controls on UF1. This mode allows us to control the pan position of our tracks with the VPOTs. The other VPOT assignment modes are track, send, plugin, instrument, and EQ. You can access all of the VPOT assignment modes via the soft keys on UF1. For me, most are on my second page. It may be different for you on a fresh out of the box UF1. Of course, if you'd like to change where the VPOT assignment modes are located, you can do that using the 360 app as I showed you earlier. Many of the VPOT assignment modes give you multiple parameters that can be controlled using the VPOTs. You navigate through these parameters using UF1's cursor keys. Track mode moves track information onto the VPOTs. Currently, the VPOT is showing the first parameter in track mode, which is the fader level. As I scroll right on the cursor keys to the next parameters, you'll see that track mode also gives me access to pan, the type of track we are working on, mono, stereo, left, right, or surround, which input from my interface the track is taking signal from, the output of the track, and the track's current automation mode. Several of the VPOT assignment modes also allow the user to hold down the soft key for the mode that we are working in, 
and then use the V-Pots to select which parameter we want to work with. This can be slightly quicker than scrolling with the cursor keys. If we were to press the track mode soft key again, it would automatically open the GUI of the first plugin on our track. Track mode provides access to useful stuff, but it's all things that seem to be easily accessible elsewhere on UF1. So I don't tend to find myself using this VPOT assignment mode that often. The assignment modes that I use most often are send mode and plugin mode, so I'll run through their features quickly. And like I said a minute ago, please do read up on the other VPOT assignment modes if you'd like to know more about them. VPOT assignment send mode is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. It moves Logic's send controls onto the VPOTs of UF1. I find this mode super useful. Select send mode. Straight away, we can see UF1's screen now reads SI. This is actually S1, meaning send one. And seeing this indicates that we're in send mixer view. On the channel VPOT and on the four additional VPOTs, we can see track information and where send one is outputting to for multiple tracks in my door. If you haven't set up a send at this point, this space will be blank. You can create a send or change a current sends output by turning the VPOT and then pressing it to confirm selection and create the send. Pressing down on the cursor key will go to the next send slot, two, three, etc. Pressing right on the cursor key will scroll to the next page of the send VPOT mode and show the send level. There are two more pages of parameters to the right, allowing you to select the position of your send in relation to your fader and whether the send is active or muted. As I mentioned before, you can also press and hold the send key, then use the VPOTs to go straight to the parameter of your choice. Back to the send level page, and my VPOTs are now controlling the amount of signal being passed through the send. Turn them to change the level. Press to reset to zero. With the additional VPOTs, I can control multiple channels within the same bank at the same time. And as before, press down on the cursor key to navigate to the next send. My favorite thing to do with send mode is to navigate UF1 to the channel and the send that we wish to control, and then hit the flip key. This moves the send level onto the fader, allowing for extremely smooth and precise movements. Hit shift, enable latch automation mode, press play, and now you can write in automation for your send level. This is great for something like a reverb send, as you can perform very expressive movements and effect swells that respond to the source material. This is a much more intuitive and articulate way of creating automation and can add nuance and movement to a static mix. I love doing this with my sends, so try it out. Just remember to turn automation mode back to read when you're done. Pressing the send key again switches to send channel view. We know that we're in send channel view when we can see SE on uf one screen. In send channel view, rather than showing the same parameter for multiple channels, the VPOTs display multiple parameters for the same channel. So in theory, I could change the destination of the send at the same time as the amount of level going to it. But why would you want to do that? I'll be honest, send channel view is probably more useful on a UF8, where you have more space and access to parameters, and for example, could control the levels of send one and send two at the same time. The plugin VPOT assignment mode gives us a similar level of control, but over any of the plugin slots in our session. Press plugin to load VPOT plugin mode. Plugin mixer view loads up, and similarly to the send mixer view, P1 in the center of the screen tells us that we are looking at the plugin in insert slot one across multiple channels. If there isn't a plugin loaded, this will be blank. And just like in sends view, if we turn the VPOT, we begin scrolling through all of our possible plugin choices. Pressing the VPOT will load the highlighted plugin on the channel in the currently selected slot. If you have a lot of plugins, as many of us do, you'd have to be an absolute insaniac to want to load a plugin up this way. If though, your plugins are already inserted, you can simply press the VPOT and the GUI for that plugin will open. Use the up and down cursor keys to scroll through plugin slots. If the currently selected track in your door has plugins loaded in those slots, the GUIs will open as you scroll through. I find that this can be a really quick and useful way of navigating through a long chain of plugins on a single channel. Loading a new plugin with a VPOP or opening an existing plugin via VPOP goes into a sub-menu of plugin mode where all of the controls of the plugin are laid out across UF1's VPOTs. 
The first four controls appear on the screen and we can simply grab the VPOTs and tweak those parameters. Hit five to eight to go to the next four controls and bank further through more controls with the cursor keys. Remember to alternate between one to four and five to eight though, so that you don't miss any of the controls. And of course, press down on the cursor key to swap to the next plugin in the chain when you're ready. We can press the plugin key again to close the GUI and back out into plugin mixer view. When in the mixer view, if we press the plugin key again, we go to plugin channel view. Now, instead of seeing the same plugin slot across multiple channels, we see multiple plugin slots across the same selected channel. Plugin slots one to four show on the VPOTs. If we press the five to eight key, we see plugin slots five to eight. In this view, we can use the cursor keys to go to previous or next channels. You can use the channel encoder too. Just find the channel you want to work on and press the select key. VPOT plugin mode is useful and I do find myself using it fairly often. Much like send mode, it's pretty cool to be able to flip a plugin's parameter onto a fader and record automation as I'm riding that control. However, there are some caveats, at least for me. Personally, I would not bother using VPOT plugin mode with any kind of complicated plugin that has lots of controls. Simple plugins work best where you aren't having to scroll through multiple pages to find the parameter that you want to control. Even with a UF8, which lays out more channels and gives me more screen space, adjusting something like a channel strip plugin, or God forbid, a Shadow Hills mastering compressor, can be a bit of a nightmare. It's not just the scrolling through endless pages though. The parameters can be laid out in a really weird order that doesn't correspond to the plugin GUI. And the Mackie control protocol can sometimes absolutely butcher parameter names into illegible nonsense. I'm often not sure if I'm EQing a compressor's sidechain or doing a Danish lesson on Duolingo. These are unfortunately constraints of the Mackie control protocol and not bizarre design choices by the SSL engineering team. We've already seen SSL tackle some of the other limitations of the Mackie protocol with updates to the 360 software. So it's my hope that the SSL wizards can come up with a better way of controlling plugins through 360 in the future. As I said, I won't be covering the other VPOT assignment modes, but instrument mode, for example, is pretty much the same as plugin mode, but for instrument plugins. And that just about covers everything when using UF1 on its own as a standalone door controller. If I were to add a UC1 to the setup and throwing a UF8 into the equation, if I'm using them as basic door controllers, nothing much changes, but they complement each other perfectly and give me more of the features already offered. Cool, so long boring video over, right? Wrong. Because alongside UF1, SSL are releasing 360 1.5, which adds in some new major and minor features, a brand new plugin, and some really tight integration between UF1, UF8, and UC1. All the stuff I've covered so far was just bare bones basic door operation. So let's get to the good stuff. So let's just quickly run over everything that's been added, changed and updated in SSL 360 1.5. SSL 360 1.5 introduces follow door track selection and solo and cut selection when using 4KB and channel strip 2 in Cubase and Nuendo. The 360 plugin mixer will be able to follow your selected track within those doors and thus in turn the channel strip on that selected track should automatically be reflected on UC1. I say should, I use logic so I haven't actually tried this. Also for Cubase users, UF8 will now have a fader readout on screen at all times. UF1 gets its own excellent 360 mode, but more on that in a minute. And there are also some minor updates to SSL 12 in 360 1.5. I'm not going to cover these, but if you have an SSL 12, make sure you get the update. This next one is big, big news. I've been asking them to do this for a long time now. 360 1.5 debuts the very first SSL resizable GUIs with updates to 4KB and Channel Strip 2. With these updated plugins, in the bottom right corner of the GUI, we have a magnifying glass icon. Click it or right click anywhere in the GUI that is a blank space and you'll be offered a selection of resizing options. 
The visual difference between 100% and 200% is insane. Uh, obviously, it's just double the size, but it makes it so much easier to work with for those of us using 4K screens like myself. Going forward, I imagine all new SSL plugins will ship with this feature, but let's keep our fingers crossed that SSL can revisit some old ones and update them to include resizing options. And then finally, of course, SSL 360 1.5 also adds in the brand new SSL meter plugin. Let's take a look at that. This is SSL meter. It doesn't process your audio in any way. It's a tool to give you visual information on several different aspects of how your audio sounds. The plugin looks great. The graphics are all really sharp and clean and all of the information is really easy to read. Very important for a metering plugin, obviously. In the bottom right, we can see that SSL meter is also a resizable GUI. We have a settings menu and a help icon that enables useful tips and descriptions when hovering over different aspects of the GUI. The bottom half of meter is dedicated to this lovely 31 band real-time analyzer, displaying the real-time DBFS levels of frequency points from 20 Hz up to 20 kHz. We can mouse over individual bands to get an accurate reading of that particular frequency and can click to lock it in whilst we mouse over to analyze another frequency. On the upper left, we have a peak and RMS meter. We can enable or disable true peak metering and use this drop-down menu to choose from various metering scales. Just next door, we have a Lissajou vector scope, a left-right balance bar, and at the bottom, a phase correlation meter. All super useful tools for monitoring your mix's stereo width, stereo balance, and mono compatibility. On the right of the plugin is the analog meter section, where we have a left and a right classically styled VU meter. You can switch the analog meter from VU mode to PPM mode, a reference more commonly used in broadcast. There are lots of options to change in the plugin settings for things like metering hold times, fade times for the Lissajou, and different lineup standards for the VU meter. Above the analog meters is a reset button which will instantly clear all values. On the top left is a bypass and a number which corresponds to the door channel that this instance of meter is running on. Right of that is the track name, and then finally, the eagle-eyed viewers amongst you will have noticed the 360 logo. That's because Meter is a 360 compatible plugin. Pressing the button will launch 360 directly to the plugin mixer page, where we can see the center section has a new addition, SSL Meter. Living here above Bus Comp 2 in the collapsible window, we can access all of the same information as in the main plugin GUI by flicking through the different views here. You can have eight SSL meter plugins loaded in your door and choose which one you're viewing via the selection boxes. This sort of metering is very useful on your main mix output, but it can also be very helpful to have metering plugins on buses and even individual tracks. As you flick through the different instances of meter you have loaded up, they retain the view that you left them in. So if you have the main overview mode open on your mix, but you want a VU meter on your kick or bass, 360 lets you do that. Here's where the real magic starts to happen though. Because of 360's computer nerd brain wizardry, Logic can run the plugin, which is then picked up by 360 and then beamed over onto UF1. If we go back to UF1 and hold down the mode button and now select meter plugin with the soft key, we enter meter mode, which fully displays everything the SSL meter plugin has to offer right in front of us, outside of the computer, right on UF1. If I press the green overview button, we cycle through the different views Meter offers. The other soft keys give me the reset control, a fine-tuned toggle for making adjustment to the settings, and I can even load the plugin's presets. The first VPOT lets you scroll between your eight instances of Meter, displaying track name for easy recognition, and of course remembering the view that you last left them on. The other three VPOTs handle everything in the plugin's settings menu, so you really don't have to open the plugin should you need to make adjustments to anything. Settings span over into a second page, which we can access with the page button. I've always found metering plugins helpful to my mixing. I find it very useful to be able to reference against a set of standards for volume, frequency response, and phase relationships. 
and to compare what I'm working on with other material that I like the sound of. Yeah, yeah, we've all heard it before, you should mix with your ears. But mixing with a metering plugin allows you to trust what your ears are telling you because it gives you data on what you're actually hearing. In the past, I've tended to dislike using metering plugins as it means you always have to have a plugin open and in view somewhere on your screen. To get around this, for a number of years now, I've been using a TC Electronic Clarity M stereo metering system. The TC was fantastic, but it has now gone in favor of the UF1. Sure, it had a bigger screen than UF1, but as a small desktop device, it was always a little awkward to place it, and I was running out of desktop space. UF1 was much more convenient for me as someone who already had a UC1 and a UF8. It naturally fits into that ecosystem. If further comparing UF1 to the Clarity M, the SSL meter plugin currently lacks an LUFS readout. I predict that this will be UF1's equivalent of UF8's outpouring of cries for transport controls, but rest assured, SSL are very much aware that this will be a heavily requested feature, and I'm sure that they will likely do an updated version of Meter that includes LUFS. The other previous dislike I've had with using metering plugins is that they are limited to metering only the audio within your door. I find it most useful if I can meter all audio leaving my system, so I can easily reference against other sources. Luckily for you though, I'm a really smart and generous guy, so I'm going to show you how you can do exactly that. Unfortunately, it's not something that can be done natively with SSL 360, but the SSL nerds are also kind of smart, so maybe they'll figure it out one day. We're going to need an application from a company called Rogue Amoeba. The app is called Audio Hijack. This is Mac only, maybe there's a Windows alternative, but I'm not sure. Audio Hijack lets us really customize how the audio engine of macOS works. We can take audio from one location, whether that's an app, an input source, and send it out to various locations. You can split signals, record signals, even live stream them. But most importantly for what we want to do, we can insert AU plugins on any audio stream. So what we want to do is create an output block that is our system output. So all audio leaving our computer and run it into an SSL meter plugin. You can then link that up to the output of your interface that hits your speakers. And just like that, you can now use SSL meter to meter all audio, no matter what app it's coming from. As long as your audio hijack session is running in the background, UF1 should display that instance of the meter plugin and give you all of the same controls and functionality as if it were in your door. One thing to be aware of though, doing this can introduce some recording latency into your system. You would likely notice this if when recording, you're monitoring through your door's main stereo outputs. As before this audio hits your interface, it's running through audio hijack. Let's say you were recording guitar to a backing track, and as you were playing, it sounded like you were perfectly in time and nailed the performance. But upon playback, it sounds like your playing is a little bit late, delayed, and requires some timing adjustments. This is because the signal that you're hearing and performing to is passing through audio hijack where it's being delayed. And this is perfectly normal. All software will add some sort of delay. Obviously, you can't hear the delay as you're performing, everything sounds normal to you. But because the audio you're monitoring and performing to is being delayed, your performance is being recorded to the wrong place. Almost as if you just reacted really slowly to the backing track. It likely won't be a huge delay, but it will be noticeable. But now, if you encounter it, you know why. So how can you get around this? For me, I don't monitor my stereo output when recording. I use headphone cues, which are sends on every track or groups of tracks in Logic, being fed directly to an output on my interface. So the signal that I'm monitoring to track and perform to is not being passed through Audio Hijack and thus not being delayed. I hope that that makes sense. But yes, key takeaway, you can use SSL Meter across your whole system by using Audio Hijack. And finally, let's sort of just mush everything together and take a look at how UF1, UF8, UC1, SSL360 
and the brand new meter plugin all come together to form a tightly integrated SSL workflow. I'm working on a mix in Logic and I have access to faders and pans for eight tracks over on UF8, with UF1 also showing me the first track in that bank and displaying a beats and bars readout on its big screen. I can move faders, tweak pan positions and use the channel encoder on UF8 to scroll through tracks. Meanwhile, the encoder on UF1 is in focus mode, so I can use it to adjust plugin parameters. If I jump into any of the VPOT assignment modes, all of my options and parameters are spread out across both UF1 and UF8. I've got several SSL meter plugins loaded up in my session, and I can view any of them by putting UF1 into meter mode. On the left, UC1 is doing its own thing, giving me full control of any Channel Strip 2 or 4KB plugins in my session. Every track has a Channel Strip plugin loaded on it, and I have a selection of bus compressor plugins loaded up too. I can navigate through any of them and make adjustments via UC1. Pressing the 360 button on UC1 opens up the plugin mixer page of 360, giving me a full console view of my session. Every strip of the mixer represents one of my channel strip plugins. I can also see my meter and bus compressor plugins. As I scroll through on the UC1, the selection is mirrored in 360, as are any changes I make to the strips. The reverse of this works too. If I make selections or changes in 360, they are mirrored by UC1. Let's now change the door layer on UF8 to door layer 2, which I have set to the plugin mixer. UF8 is now no longer controlling logic, instead giving me access to all of my channel strip plugins. Each channel and fader on UF8 represents a channel strip plugin in my session. The faders on UF8 control the channel faders in 360, which in turn represent the output faders in the GUIs of 4KB and CS2. On UF8's displays, we can see the channel name and number, which version of the channel strip plugin we're currently using on that channel, the fader level, and a meter. We can change the meter between input and output level by pressing Quick Key 3 on UF8. We can also see how much compression or gating is acting on that channel. Making adjustments to any parameter of the plugin, either via UC1 or in the plugin mixer, shows this change at the bottom of UF8's screen, but it also automatically moves that control onto UF8's VPOTs for all channels. If you'd like to adjust channel strip settings purely on UF8, you can do that using UF8's soft keys. All parameters of the channel strip plugins are available to access, spread over five pages. We can scroll through those with the soft key select buttons or the page left right keys. Simply find the parameter you wish to control, press its soft key, and that control now becomes available on the VPOTs of UF8 for all channels. For pot controls, simply twist the VPOT or press it in to reset to its default position. For button controls, just press the VPOT. Of course, we can navigate through the plugin mixer via UF8 too. Just use the channel encoder to scroll through tracks. The selection of tracks shown on UF8 is represented in 360 by the dark blue bar at the bottom of the interface. The light selection around the perimeter of a channel strip shows the currently selected channel on UC1. So right now we have direct control over nine channels of the mix. Whilst all of this is happening, UF1 is still performing in the logic door layer, giving me control of channels, pans, sends, etc. within logic itself. If I were to change UF1's door layer to also be the plugin mixer, by holding the 360 key and selecting with the corresponding soft key, UF1's screens now change into the plugin mixer view. On UF1's channel screen, we get the same display that UF8 uses on its channels. The soft key above the screen acts as a bypass for the plugin, and the VPOT below becomes a pan control for stereo instances of channel strip plugins. UF1's big display now shows a timecode readout, and an EQ graph fills the middle of the screen. Across UF1's top soft keys, we have access to all of the toggle button controls in the channel strip, whereas the four VPOTs allow us to control parameters that use knobs. We can use the left-right buttons on UF1 to page through all available controls. UF1's cursor keys allow us to scroll the plug-in mixer interface, and the jog wheel and transport controls remain active, allowing us to navigate our door session. Quick Key 1 will clear all solos, and Quick Key 2 toggles fine-tune mode for smoother control of parameters. The channel encoder lets us select new channels in 360, 
and the bank keys will jump through in banks. A quick press of the mode button on UF1 will cycle us to the meter mode, which functions exactly the same as previously described when using the logic door layer. Press mode again to go back to the channel strip view. By default, UF1 will mirror the channel selected on UC1, or vice versa. I find this especially useful working with the new 4KB channel strip, as all of the additional controls that were added to that plugin, such as enabling the preamp, driving the gain, and the compressor mix control, are all immediately available on UF1, presented clearly and easy to adjust. You can access these controls on UC1 of course, but you have to enter a sub-menu and scroll through parameters to access them. This is a much slicker way of accessing those controls. And of course we can also use the fader on UF1 to control the plugin's output fader, rather than having to use the output gain knob on UC1. UF1 does not have to follow UC1 though. Pressing the master soft key on UF1 will allow it to act as its own channel control independent of UC1. In 360, we now have a light blue bar at the bottom of the interface, displaying which channel UF1 is controlling. So now, I have access to one channel strip of my session on UC1, one channel on UF1, and eight channels on UF8. So 10 channels of my mix in total, laid out in front of me across all of the SSL control devices. Let's press the master key again, so UF1 is linked to UC1. As I make changes to this channel's filters on UC1, an EQ graph comes to life with colourful curves, representing the filter movements I'm dialing in. The same goes for the four bands of EQ too. As I make changes, they get painted onto UF1's display. And as I scroll through tracks, this display refreshes to show the currently selected track's EQ shape. One thing to remember is that the EQs on SSL consoles are not digital, clean EQs. They are not your FabFilter Pro Q3. They are analog circuits with complex filter curves and harmonics. There's been many a moaning, semi-angry online comment over the years along the lines of, why doesn't the 1K on an SSL console plugin correspond to actual 1000 Hz? I'm sure there's a super deep, complicated answer. The simple answer is, that's not how the hardware works, thus not how the plugin works. It also just doesn't really matter. Being a sonic surgeon isn't really how these EQs were designed to be used. It's more of a strap yourself into the driver's seat kind of thing. Just grab some knobs and twist until it sounds good. And if you do want to get surgical and precise, reach for something else. Load up a precise and surgical EQ. Simple. And the reason I've dredged up this age-old topic of discussion is so that you understand the EQ graph on UF1. The graph isn't showing the numeric values of where you physically dialed the EQ knobs in. It's showing what the EQ is actually doing at those settings. This is quite useful as it can help you to understand better how an SSL EQ actually works. And it just looks cool having a little EQ GUI in front of you. That's the most important thing. The EQ circuits vary between different models of SSL consoles. They don't all have the same EQ, hence why many of us have preferences over which style of SSL EQ we like. UF1's EQ graph can be a useful tool to actually see some of those differences. If we dial in 50 Hz at max gain on both the 4KB and Channel Strip 2 plugin and flick between them, we'll see the resulting EQ shapes are significantly different from one another. Obviously, we can hear those tonal differences, but it's cool to be able to see them represented visually, which can enhance our understanding of why and how SSL EQ circuits have varying sonic characteristics. And that just about covers everything, I think. We've been over most of the basic door control features of UF1, and we've covered the deeper integration with UC1, UF8, and SSL 360, and what you can do there, at least what you can do currently. Who knows what updates SSL are working on for either deeper door and 360 integration. Well, me actually, but I'm not saying anything for now. You'll just have to wait and see. Yo, so a little edit here. SSL have actually given me the go ahead to reveal a little bit more information about what's coming in SSL 360 1.6. 
I'm allowed to be a little bit less vague, but still retain an air of professional mystery. So where 360 1.5 is largely based around the introduction of the UF1 to the 360 ecosystem, 1.6's focus will be on adding in a brand new 360 enabled and UC1 compatible console plugin. I'm not allowed to say what it is, but if you consider how SSL made a big deal about revisiting the very start of their lineage with the release of the 4KB, you should be able to make an educated guess as to where they might be going next. Alongside that, we'll be seeing a wealth of improvements for 360 and the plug-in mixer, and SSL are also hoping to add in some highly requested features for UF8. SSL's UF1 is out now and available from all good retailers for £599. And for my American friends, I don't know the conversion, so why don't we just say 2,500 big ones, and then if it's cheaper than that, you'll be nicely surprised and you can send me the difference. As always, thank you very much for watching. I'm Benny Dunville. Look me up, say hello, whatever. I may be back with more videos, I may not be. I haven't quite decided yet. For now though, I'd better go. I think I can hear the clinking of pitchforks from an angry lynch mob of pro audio YouTubers raging at my door. See ya.